the program generously supported by uh, the director, Eric Peterson, to bring in two visiting professors a year, uh, sponsored by the fellowship program uh, and picked by the fellows themselves. Um, and uh, the goal is to have uh, well-known researchers in a variety of different disciplines come and spend time with our fellows and faculty here. And I can think of no one better than Deepak. And so he was an enthusiastic choice of all the fellows this year. And he'll spend time today with the fellows and with some of the faculty. And I think he'll share a lot of his experiences and wisdom with us. And so we're really excited to have him here. Deepak and I go way back to, um, I guess, uh, July of 1996 when we met as fellows at Cleveland Clinic. And we were both bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And um, we, we did a lot of things together in three years. And I remember it very well some of the fun times sitting around a table and just posing research ideas to a group of us that kind of got uh, interested and in, um, engaged in that. And, uh, and then, you know, look what happened. Now Deepak is a senior uh, investigator at the Timmy Group, um, director of an interventional program uh, that's integrated through the Boston VA system in Brigham and Women's Hospital and the director of cardiology at the Boston VA and numerous other titles. I don't think I can actually read all your titles here, Deepak, because we, <laughs> you wouldn't have any time to speak. But, I mean, he's accomplished... A tremendous amount. He's a, a close friend and colleague of many of ours here at the DCRI. Um, uh, he's tr had tremendous success in research, but he, he always has a place for trainees, especially fellows, and he's worked very closely with fellows at, at the institutions he's been at, as well as our fellows here through various committees um, with the AHA and the ACC. And so I think it's, he's a perfect person to come as our visiting professor. We look forward to his presentation today, which is going to focus on lessons learned from the recent SAVER trial that uh, he presented at the ESC conference about a month and a half ago. And I think many of you will have a chance to spend time with him later today. So thank you, Deepak. Okay, thanks. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for that very warm and kind and personal introduction, Matt. Uh, as, as you heard, we've gone back many years, been close friends for a long time. And indeed, my relationship with DCRI goes back now many years, and it's, it's really terrific to be here. I was just uh, talking to Dr. Peterson's assistant. The first time I ever came here was to interview with Dr. Greenfield, and I was rushing to my interview, and this was in the old hospital. I got stuck in the elevator. So you can imagine how stressful that uh, first uh, appearance was. So by comparison, this is really quite stress-free. Uh, it's been really a, a long-standing relationship that I've had with a lot of the faculty and fellows through the year. Uh, here at DCRI and, and uh, Duke in general, and, and I, I've really enjoyed that. It's a great group of people that you've got here, and I'm happy to, in whatever small way I can, be a part of that larger Duke family. So what I was asked by Matt to speak about, really, was the SAVER trial, and I think that's um, because it's relevant to those of you here that are involved with clinical trials, which is all of you, but especially those involved with diabetes outcome trials. As you know, that's been something that's been in vogue the past few years, cardiologists, endocrinologists getting together and doing these large outcome trials. Uh, listed here are my disclosures. The SABRE trial was funded by AstraZeneca and Bristol-Myers Squibb. That funding went to Brigham and Women's Hospital and to Hadassah Medical Center in Israel. So I think everyone here knows that Diabetics have uh, lots of problems, uh, and, and they're largely in two flavors. One is uh, that they're at increased risk of microvascular complications, things like blindness, uh, retinopathy, nephropathy, amputation, and improved glycemic control is believed to reduce the risk of microvascular complications. We can talk about some of those fundamental assumptions, but that's something that has been uh, passed on through the ages, and, and lots of older literature certainly <laughs> supports the association between better glucose control and lower risk of microvascular complications. But uncertainty had persisted regarding macrovascular complications, MI, stroke, cardiovascular death. Would glycemic control per se, or due to other characteristics of diabetes drugs, potentially reduce cardiovascular outcomes, improve cardiovascular outcomes by reducing those complications? And, to test this, we examined saxagliptin, a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor, which is known to lower glucose to see what its impact might be on cardiovascular outcomes. By way of background, there was a pooled analysis of phase 2 and 3 data, as shown here, that showed a lower rate of ischemic events, major adverse cardiac events, with saxagliptin versus the respective control arms in those trials, not always a true placebo, but the control arms in those trials, and overall there was a lower event rate with saxagliptin versus control 
uh, though it's important to note, even though the p-value, which I haven't shown, would have been significant, this is based on 41 events. But a much larger meta-analysis that wasn't <coughs> specific only to saxagliptin, but included all the DPP4 inhibitors, basically did show the same thing. That is, there was a lower rate of MACE across the board, and even mortality was heading in the right direction with a p-value of less than 0.05. So this caused a lot of excitement in the field, and people really started thinking maybe these drugs not only lower glucose, and hopefully by doing that reduce the risk of microvascular complications, maybe they actually reduce macrovascular complications. And what is um, uh, worth noting on this curve here is that there's a pretty early separation of these curves, which again inspired a lot of confidence in people close to the field of DPP-4 inhibition in that pathway. Myself, I was a little skeptical why curves would separate so early in what was essentially relatively young, healthy, diabetic people without much in the way of cardiovascular comorbidities. It didn't really seem that plausible. But the explanation uh, that aficionados gave me was that there were pleiotropic effects that were accounting for this. Uh, though I must say, uh, I'm always skeptical of that word. But uh, regardless, there was some thought that there was a benefit in terms of cardiovascular outcomes and, and a lot of excitement building around that. What ultimately catalyzed this trial, though, and all the other trials, including the two that DCRI is involved with, was this regulatory guidance that came out from the FDA, where the FDA stated in 2008 uh, verbatim that hemoglobin A1C remains an acceptable primary efficacy endpoint for approval of drugs seeking an indication to treat hyperglycemia secondary to diabetes. However, and this was the big however, a post-marketing trial generally will be necessary to definitively show that the upper bound of the two-sided 95% confidence interval for the estimated risk ratio is less than 1.3. So that's what really spawned this series of trials, uh, a goal of showing non-inferiority uh, with, depending on how you look at it, a rather tight or a rather generous uh, boundary for that uh, confidence interval. So the primary objective of the saver timmy 53 trial then was to determine whether saxagliptin, when added to good background therapy, would be non-inferior to placebo for the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal ischemic stroke with an upper 95% confidence interval of the hazard ratio of less than 1.3. So non-inferiority to do what the FDA said to do. But if that non-inferiority goal were met, the goal was then to examine for superiority and the reason that was in there was because there were at least some smart scientists and physicians that thought superiority might be achievable, including in a trial with presumably intermediate duration follow-up. This is the trial duration. Dr. Brownwald was the chair, along with myself, Itamar Raz, who is an endocrinologist from Hadassah Medical Center in Israel, were the co-PIs of the trial. And, you know, the typical uh, sort of international uh, lead investigators, uh, some of the best cardiologists and endocrinologists throughout the world. Importantly, every country had both a cardiologist and endocrinologist. We thought it was uh, philosophically important uh, not just to execute the trial, but even later on in terms of interpreting it uh, and, and how it was viewed to have that type of joint leadership right from the PI level internationally down to the uh, national lead investigators down to the site level. So we really did push for that. Uh, and it was a global trial. It enrolled very quickly, 16,492 patients between May of 2010 and December of 2011. And uh, everyone was really excited about that. Uh, the sponsor was excited about that. That, of course, meant in what was an event-driven trial, the uh, overall study duration would decrease. That decreases costs, gets the data out quicker. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, excitement on their part about that. From the investigator's standpoint, it's always fun to be in a trial that's enrolling briskly. I'm sure all of you have heard of, never participated in trials that enroll slowly. And that can be really quite tedious. So uh, there was a lot of excitement about the uh, quick enrollment. But I think there were some consequences to that. Uh, obviously in terms of affecting the overall study duration and therefore the drug exposure. The worldwide enrollment was good. In particular, we were proud of the fact that we got a lot of patients in from North America. That's not always easy to do in randomized clinical trials, as you're aware. But we did go through special efforts to 
to get the U.S. and, and Canada uh, enrolling briskly. This is enrollment by specialty. The bulk of enrollment was cardiology and endocrinology because of the structure and organizational leadership of the trial. But we did also have uh, many general practitioners, internist family practitioners, and some nephrologists as well. Uh, so it really was a multidisciplinary collaboration. In terms of the study conduct, and, and I just threw this in because at, at DCRI, I know you give a lot of thought and expend a lot of effort uh, on, on these trial metrics, and, and indeed they're extremely important just in terms of having a good trial and good science, but also from a regulatory perspective uh, from the FDA and other international regulatory agencies. So in terms of the uh, percentages that didn't receive any treatment, 0.5, premature discontinuation of study drug, 20% in placebo, 18% in saxagliptin, so a little bit lower in saxagliptin, different from some of the trials we do, say antithrombotics, where obviously if you were going up against placebo, there'd be a lot more discontinuation with the active drug causing bleeding. Withdrawal of consent, 2.4%, loss to follow-up, only 0.2%, final vitus, vital status assessed, something that you all know the FDA looks at very closely, 99.1%. And this resulted in almost 17,000 patient years of follow-up and a median follow-up of 2.1 years, which is a really long-term follow-up for a diabetic drug outcome trial or a really short follow-up to see if there's an effect on micro macrovascular events. So it, it, it goes both ways, but that was a direct byproduct, again, of our very brisk enrollment. We'd initially anticipated a much longer median follow-up. So this is the overall trial design, 16,492 patients with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors, and I'll define that more precisely in a moment, who were randomized in a one-to-one -one double blind fashion to placebo or saxagliptin five milligrams a day <laughs> with a dosage adjustment based on GFR less than 50. All other diabetic treatment was at the discretion of the treating physician which is important because it's a placebo-controlled trial, but there can be add-on therapy and potentially, and indeed there was, differential add-on therapy. Likewise, cardiovascular background therapy was up to the treating physician. We went through great efforts, though, to make sure that evidence-based cardiovascular therapy, diabetes therapy, was utilized in a high percent where uh, appropriate drugs weren't given at baseline. We did what we could on a macro trial governance level to increase those levels of compliance with guidelines. The follow-up was every six months until the final visit. The primary endpoint, as I mentioned, was the triple ischemic endpoint, and the study duration was event-driven, and it was powered such that the trial would end after 1,040 primary events that resulted in a median duration of 2.1 years. I gave you the trial metrics for loss to follow-up and withdrawal of consent, which uh, at least we felt were pretty good. The major secondary endpoint was the primary endpoint plus hospitalization for heart failure or unstable angina or, or coronary revascularization. The inclusion criteria broadly were patients with diabetes who were uh, type 2 diabetes who were greater than or equal to the age of 40 and had a documented hemoglobin A1C of greater than or equal to 6.5 percent and were at high risk for a cardiovascular event, meaning they either had established cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors, meaning they had to be age, if they were male, 55 or over, female, age 60 or over, plus dyslipidemia, hypertension, and or current smoking. So that's what they had to have to get into the multiple risk factor category. To come in under the umbrella of established cardiovascular disease, they had to have stable coronary artery disease or stable cerebrovascular disease or stable peripheral artery disease. So basically anything other than a recent MI or stroke, any other form of atherosclerosis or atherothrombosis could get the patient in the trial, again, assuming they had diabetes and the other inclusion criteria. The baseline characteristics were well matched. Of course, you'd expect that in a large randomized blinded trial. The average age was 65. A third of the population was female. About 80% came in with established cardiovascular disease, about 20% came in with multiple risk factors, and we did cap that group, so that's just an artifact of the trial. The risk factors, dyslipidemia in 71%, hypertension in 82%, and you'd expect that in a patient population with diabetes, and we also had additional enrichment criteria, so that again is a, a, a bit of the underlying uh, uh, 
comorbidities that travel with diabetes and a bit of uh, artifact from what we insisted upon in order to be enrolled into the trial. Likewise, prior MI present in 38%, prior heart failure in 13%, and prior coronary revascularization in 43%. So I, I think we achieved what we wanted to, which was enrolling a high-risk population. The duration of diabetes on average was 10 years, although you can see there is quite a range. The hemoglobin A1C on average was 8, and again, there was quite a range where uh, we did allow entry of patients with hemoglobin A1C is even less than 7, though current guidelines in general wouldn't support uh, aggressive treatment of those type of patients, in particular if they're older and have cardiovascular or other comorbidities. But at the time we designed the trial, uh, there were different considerations. The baseline medication use for cardiovascular medications uh, was high and increased during the course of the trial, as I said, through our specific efforts. Likewise, diabetic medication use at baseline was high and also increased during the course of the trial. As far as actual results from the trial, uh, this slide shows what happened to the different glycemic indices over time. Mean hemoglobin A1C was significantly lower with saxagliptin in green versus placebo in blue at all the different time points that were examined. Likewise, attainment of hemoglobin A1C less than 7% was significantly higher at all the time points examined at two years, 40% with saxagliptin versus 30% with placebo. And of course, all these differences were highly statistically significant. So this wasn't particularly surprising. We would have hoped that there would be a reduction uh, with uh, saxagliptin versus placebo. Uh, that wasn't uh, novel, but um, it's important to realize these changes were in the context of a 23% reduction in the intensification of other diabetes medications with saxagliptin versus control. That was very significant. And a 30% reduction in the initiation of insulin with saxagliptin versus control. Again, uh, very significant. So there's differential add-on therapy in the two arms. There's a lot more add-on therapy in the placebo arm for other diabetes medicines versus a saxagliptin arm. And even in that context, this significant difference in hemoglobin A1C was attained. And you know, we can come back to this later, but this is one of the challenges of these sorts of trials. It's trial of a drug versus placebo, but the placebo isn't totally a placebo. There's uh, changes in background therapies in both arms, uh, but uh, the changes are uh, differential. This just shows the changes in hemoglobin A1C from baseline uh, to two years. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, shown in, in green here is a saxagliptin uh, blue again is placebo. And, and the changes that occur in people whose baseline hemoglobin is less than 7, the 7 to 7.5 seven range, 7.5 to 8.7, greater than 8.7, so by different quartiles. And you know, as you, you might imagine, the largest changes are occurring in people who have the highest level of hemoglobin A1C, but um, uh, those changes uh, are occurring even in the placebo arm. So the primary endpoint of the trial, of course, was this cardiovascular endpoint. It wasn't glycemic uh, control. And there, uh, the lines were pretty uh, superimposable, 7.3% uh, rate at two years with saxagliptin, 72 with placebo, a hazard ratio that works out to 1.00 can't get any closer to one than that. And uh, the 95% confidence interval upper boundary was 1.12, less than 1.3, which is what the FDA had uh, specified. The p-value for non-inferiority was less than 0 0.001. So clearly meeting the definition of non-inferiority that the FDA had set. Uh, obviously, with those <laughs> event rates being identical, the uh, p-value for superiority wasn't significant. The secondary endpoint, uh, larger number of events, greater statistical power, but same message, 12.8% in saxagliptin at two years, 124 with placebo, a hazard ratio, again, of one, again, meeting non-inferiority, but not superiority. This slide shows the individual endpoints, no significant difference in cardiovascular death, MI, ischemic stroke, hospitalization for coronary revascularization, hospitalization for unstable angina. Uh, one unexpected finding was an increase that was statistically significant in hospitalization for heart failure, going from a uh, rate of 2.8% with placebo to 3.5% with saxagliptin, a hazard ratio of 1.127 and the p-value of 0.007. It's like we were talking about before uh, with uh, some of the fellows. Uh, 
uh, heart failure is big, and it just seems that it crops up all over the place in, in cardiovascular medicine, but even in other fields, uh, even where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. Going into this, we were actually thinking there would be a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure based on some preclinical data with DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, but uh, that didn't turn out to be the case. Uh, All-cause mortality, uh, there was no significant difference. Going back to the primary endpoint, these are the different subgroups, and from a bottom line perspective, uh, none of the interaction p-values were uh, positive, so uh, the hazard ratio essentially was one uh, in all the different subgroups, uh, different ages, both uh, sexes, uh, inclusion criteria of established cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors across the range of GFRs that were allowed in the trial across the different durations of diabetes, across different baseline hemoglobin A1C, uh, irrespective of baseline insulin or sulfonylurea use, the hazard ratio was pretty close to one. What about microvascular complications? Of course, this itself is an argument about um, uh, what uh, the relevance of this is. Is it a surrogate? Is it an actual clinical endpoint? But uh, regardless of one's view on it, uh, these are the data in terms of shifts in microalbuminuria. So worsening of microalbuminuria categories was significantly less in the saxagliptin arm, and improvement in microalbuminuria category was significantly better in the saxagliptin versus placebo arm for the p-value of less than 0 0.001. You know, what does that mean in terms of renal events? Uh, you know, we weren't really powered to see any clinical change in renal events, but people who believe in microalbuminuria as an endpoint uh, might say that this, if the patients had continued uh, long enough on therapy, may have manifest as a reduction in, in adverse clinical renal outcomes, but that's speculative. What about hypoglycemia? Well, overall in the trial, any hypoglycemia was significantly increased from 13.4 to 15.3 percent. This was largely in excess in minor hypoglycemia. Major hypoglycemia was also significantly increased, nominally so, from 1.7 to 2.1 percent, so relatively small absolute excess. And in terms of hypoglycemia requiring hospitalization, no difference between the two arms. I should point out, though, that the definition of hypoglycemia was a very sensitive definition. That is, major hypoglycemia was that which required assistance to actively intervene. So someone had to get their spouse some orange juice for symptoms that might have been hypoglycemia or might not have been. And minor hypoglycemia was defined as having symptoms, but the patients recovered by themselves within 30 minutes, or a glucose level less than 54, even if the patient didn't have symptoms. So if they check their glucose, it was 53, they record that in their diary, that counts as minor hypoglycemia, even if they were asymptomatic. So it was a very sensitive definition. We were looking for hypoglycemia, uh, and we found it. Uh, this slide shows the percent of subjects achieving a hemoglobin A1C less than 7 without hypoglycemic events. So this is obviously a post hoc analysis, and it excludes patients with a hemoglobin A1C less than 7 at baseline because in the current era, in general, unless someone's very young and healthy, most endocrinologists would not treat that sort of patient. So this shows uh, the percentages of patients um, in saxagliptin in blue and, and placebo in green. So you can see it's a much higher percentage achieving that goal with the study drug versus placebo without having any sort of hypoglycemic event. So when added on to metformin therapy, uh, it looked uh, pretty good for this uh, post hoc uh, analysis. Uh, less so with sulfonylureas. It looked uh, reasonable as add-on therapy to insulin. Uh, so perhaps some differences with respect to the exact combinations of medications used uh, and uh, the endocrinologists on our team are trying to tease out uh, if there's any further hidden message there that might be useful for clinical practice. This slide summarizes uh, the overall adverse events, so at least uh, one AE, similar 72 percent in each, at least one significant adverse event, about 24 percent in each arm. AEs leading to discontinuation of study drug, right, about 5 percent in each arm, and AEs leading to death, a little over 1 percent in each arm, so no significant differences there. The FDA had asked for a number of endpoints of special interest. These are different things that were issues either with DPP-4 inhibitors or more broadly 
just for other diabetes drugs. So they just wanted to make sure those were or were not problems with this class of medications. And no significant difference in severe infections or opportunistic infections or liver abnormalities, bone fractures, which have been a problem with some other agents like the TZDs, 2.9% in each arm. Cancer concerns have been raised about agents like pioglitazone and bladder cancer from various associative and animal studies, but no signal here of cancer, at least within the duration of follow-up of a median of 2.1 years, 4% with saxagliptin, 4.4 with placebo. Well, what about pancreatitis? So pancreatitis events were reported by the investigator. Of course, uh, there's been a lot of interest in pancreatitis. For those of you following the field, there have been a number of reports, uh, registry-based studies, observational data showing that DPP-4 inhibitors are associated with, or as the media reports it, cause pancreatitis. So that's caused a lot of concern among patients, uh, among advocacy groups, uh, among doctors who treat diabetes. So we thought it would be wise to blindly adjudicate a pancreatitis. And I don't know if you're doing that in, in your diabetes trials, but at least to my knowledge, this was the first trial that reported adjudicated pancreatitis events. So it was blindly adjudicated by uh, experts, uh, gastroenterologists, endocrinologists, um, those sort of folks. And uh, the cases were classified into four categories. So, and, and this was perhaps influenced by my own bias being an interventional cardiologist, but I was thinking of the ARC stent thrombosis definition. So that's why there's, was it, that's why it's definite. Uh, acute pancreatitis, possible. We didn't have probable, that's the other cause. And, that's the other uh, potential cause in, in the stent thrombosis definition. But we had definite acute pancreatitis, possible acute pancreatitis, and then chronic and unlikely to be related. And I won't go through the specific uh, definitions if you're interested. It's all in the appendices of the paper. Uh, but the idea was to, with more precision than had been done before, really try to figure out does this drug cause pancreatitis or not uh, and try to um, see if we could shed some light on the issue. And the overall number of adjudicated pancreatitis events uh, was relatively low, uh, 21 events with placebo, 24 in saxagliptin, so no significant difference. Investigator uh, reported events ended up being about two and a half times this, and likewise, the numbers were essentially identical. So as best we could tell, uh, the drug wasn't causing pancreatitis, uh, and there's some more sophisticated analyses as well where we looked at drug and timing of event, and it, it didn't really seem to be a signal. Pancreatic cancer was another issue that's been raised uh, in the media, observational studies, animal data, and a lot has been made of it uh, and that DPP-4 inhibitors cause cancer. But again, we didn't see a signal of that, 12 events with placebo, five with saxagliptin, of course, no significant difference, but uh, reassuring that at least within the context of intermediate term follow-up, no horrible cancer signal is popping up. Just to drill down a little bit more into the pancreatitis aspect of things, this just shows the occurrence of pancreatitis as a function of time and uh, the definite acute pancreatitis possible, pan acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis are color-coded, but really no pattern we could see by which the drug was associated with more pancreatitis than the placebo. So we felt reasonably reassured that nothing bad was going on here. Well, heart failure deserves a little bit more of a mention uh, because that was probably the most significant p-value in the study. But beyond that, you know, there's uh, a lot of interest in diabetes, uh, drugs, and potential for heart failure. As you know, the TZDs uh, have been associated with heart failure also. And uh, we did see that excess in hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, by uh, good fortune, we had measured baseline BNP in the majority of the cohort uh, that was enrolled, about 12,000 patients out of the uh, 16,500. And here is shown the rate of hospitalization for heart failure going from quartile one to two to three to four of BNP. And as one would expect, there's nothing uh, particularly um, novel about uh, what I'm about to say. The risk of hospitalization for heart failure goes up with the baseline pre-randomization BNP level. That's to be expected. Uh, but what appeared to be the case was that the bulk of excess risk of hospitalization for heart failure was in this highest quartile of BNP. So these are folks who are in the highest quartile of BNP at baseline, some pretty high pro-BNP levels here. Uh, and in, in that uh, subgroup, those patients who had ended up being randomized to saxagliptin had about a 2% excess in the rate of hospitalization for heart failure. However, even in this uh, post hoc risk-enriched subgroup, 
uh, there was no signal of excess mortality and no significant excess in the primary or secondary composite endpoints. So it did seem to be an isolated excess in hospitalization for heart failure. And we're still working on teasing this out. We've got about 2,000 patients with pro-BNP levels at two years, and we're trying to see if there's any change in BNP that's associated with use of the drug. It's, it's really quite tricky because BNP in some studies is uh, shown to be degraded by DPP-4, therefore DPP-4 inhibition could raise BNP levels, though not pro-BNP levels, but part of that also depends on the assay. So it, it really does get kind of tricky when you're trying to see does the drug <coughs> increase hospitalization for heart failure, does it just raise BNP in certain hospitals that then diagnose something as heart failure, but it's really just uh, a byproduct of the drug and what it does uh, on DPP-4. Very tricky, but we're trying to sort this all out and hope to have something more definitive to say at the American Heart Association. So some caveats uh, that I would uh, leave you with in terms of interpreting this large trial. There was only a modest difference in glycemic control as we had to allow add-on therapy uh, for ethical reasons, and that ended up being greater in the placebo arm than in the saxagliptin arm. We couldn't think of a way ethically of doing a trial that was purely drug versus placebo because we felt physicians, if the hemoglobin A1C was out of control, would feel compelled to treat that, and that ended up being uh, differentially higher in the placebo arm uh, than in the saxagliptin arm. The median follow-up ended up being 2.1 years, which is pretty long or pretty short, depending on how you look at it. But uh, for the purposes of cardiovascular benefit, I think it's pretty short. That is, if we really wanted to see a difference from uh, a modest degree of glycemic control on cardiovascular outcomes, it would have had to have been a much longer trial. I think this trial does disprove, though, the pleiotropy hypothesis. That is, if there was some early benefit kicking in, at least in these patients with cardiovascular disease or at risk for it, we didn't see that uh, pleiotropic benefit. Uh, but this doesn't discount the possibility that lower hemoglobin A1C uh, improves cardiovascular outcomes. It's still very difficult to prove that because even if we had continued follow-up for another five years, w which uh, there was uh, very little interest on, on the sponsor's part in doing that because they really were trying to meet the FDA mandate, but even if uh, we had managed to convince them just to do it for the sake of science, it would have been tough to keep the contrast between the two arms present. It would have likely narrowed further uh, with greater add-on therapy in the placebo arm. So it would have probably still ended up just being a few years of a modest differential in glycemic control. So to really do a trial to nail down the hypothesis that lower hemoglobin A1C is better would be very challenging. Uh, but hopefully someone can design such a trial and, and really prove in the contemporary era with patients on statins at lower hemoglobin A1C across the range of hemoglobin A1C elevations really does reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, that's still a, a, a pressing question. And, and finally, the study wasn't designed to assess the impact of therapy on microvascular events. Again, that would need to be a different study. We would actually have needed to look for those type of events more carefully, and it would need to be a much longer study uh, than what we had designed. So to conclude then, when added to the standard of care in patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk, saxagliptin neither reduced nor increased the risk of the primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, MI, or ischemic stroke. And in doing that, it satisfied the FDA's mandate to show non-inferiority. In addition, things that we learned from this trial that uh, may be useful for patient care is that saxagliptin improved glycemic control, it decreased the need for insulin and other diabetes medications, it did increase hypoglycemic events, something that really was felt not to be the case before we started the trial, though that seemed odd to me that an agent that lowers glucose wouldn't cause hypoglycemic events, but, but the thinking uh, and um, wisdom had been that this was a different class of medicines that doesn't cause hypoglycemic events, it, but indeed it does. But on the other hand, it's not hospitalization for hypoglycemia. It does seem to be relatively minor hypoglycemic events, at least in the context of a randomized clinical trial with careful screening. How that would play out in real life, of course, uh, might be a little different. Uh, it did prevent progression of microalbuminuria, but that could be debated among nephrologists and cardiologists and endocrinologists what that actually means. But if it doesn't have any bad side effect, probably a good thing to have less microalbuminuria. And importantly, it didn't increase the risk of either pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer or other adverse signals seen with other diabetes medicines like cancers in general or fractures. 
So lots of important safety data uh, beyond just the cardiovascular outcome. Well, what about heart failure? There was a higher incidence of hospitalization for heart failure. As I mentioned, that was unexpected. We went into it with a hypothesis that the drug would lower the risk of hospitalization for heart failure, not increase it. But it was predefined, uh, pre-specified, adjudicated endpoint, though a component of a secondary composite endpoint that overall was neutral. So uh, some uh, caution in terms of uh, over-interpreting it. And, and we felt that it did merit further evaluation largely given the history of other diabetic agents in heart failure. As I mentioned, the TZDs have been associated uh, with heart failure. Vildegliptin in a small mechanistic study had been shown to increase ventricular volume, so that's always a concerning finding. It's a small study, but still uh, it's also in the same class of DPP-4 inhibitors, so potentially some biological rationale for why heart failure might be increasing. And as I mentioned, additional analyses are ongoing uh, from our group. Uh, ben Srickel presented AHA, a much more detailed analysis of the BNP data as well as some other clinical data. But the preliminary analyses suggest that the absolute risk is highest in patients with elevated baseline clinical risk or uh, uh, elevated BNP. Now, of course, you wouldn't necessarily have had an elevated BNP. We only had that because we did this trial. But the biggest predictor of risk here was baseline history of heart failure. So those patients, and that was 13% of this population, had a five-fold risk of subsequent hospitalization for heart failure. And those patients also had excess risk of hospitalization for heart failure due to saxagliptin versus placebo. So it seemed that either clinical or biomarker predictors of hospitalization for heart failure in general were also predictors of a greater incremental risk of hospitalization for heart failure from saxagliptin uh, versus placebo, which also makes me think that this is a real finding and not just a spurious uh, finding from having examined multiple endpoints in a trial. So what are the implications then uh, of this uh, cardiovascular outcome trial? Well, I believe that it, it does highlight the importance of performing large trials with clinical cardiovascular endpoints for diabetes drugs. Some people from the media ask me, should these trials continue? Should they continue for DPP-4 inhibitors now that uh, Sabre hasn't shown anything in a similar, uh, though much smaller, trial examine of another DPP-4 inhibitor? Also, didn't find any cardiovascular benefit, also didn't find any cardiovascular harm. And I think the answer to that is a very strong and easy yes, of course. I think the only way we really will advance the field of diabetes is by doing these sorts of large cardiovascular outcome trials. And if we do nothing else other than show safety, I still think that's pretty good and useful and takes us much further than where we are right now with TZDs or sulfonylureas, for example. So I do think these sorts of trials need to continue. And beyond the cardiovascular outcomes, I think just exploring other outcomes, pancreatitis, cancer, et cetera, is useful because clinicians and patients want to know what uh, use of these drugs does uh, to their overall risks, not just cardiovascular risks, not just microvascular complications. The other important point, too, is that I think further research is still needed to explore and tease out this relationship between hemoglobin A1C and cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, I certainly don't think the story's over here. We need other trials, longer duration follow-up to see if there is any sort of impact. Uh, and uh, if there isn't, I still think, um, you know, the message is an important one, and probably then it would mean we ought to focus on doing other things in patients with diabetes, lipid control, blood pressure control, and maybe novel approaches that we aren't even considering at the present time. Well, thank you very much for your attention. It really is a privilege to get to come here to DCRI and speak with all of you, and if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great, thanks. No, so uh, the, the new system is yeah. set up so you just speak loudly so, and I'll, I'll repeat it if needed. So, uh, it's a great uh, talk and actually it's really good to see an interventionalist uh, uh, appreciate heart failure. Um, <laughs> I'm working on that issue. I need to speak friends, that in some. <laughs> uh, here. And so um, hopefully we'll take some lessons learned. So really two questions. One is like um, from a policy standpoint, you know, what, what's your thinking now after completing uh, SABER? Did it meet the goals that um, FDA outlined and the concerns from the clinical community uh, for uh, these drugs? And two, like, are there things that we should modify for the, for the future? Um, I mean, it's very 
cut and dry in terms of what the rules are for, for approval. And then the, the second issue is more clinical, like um, how should we approach our patients with heart failure with um, diabetes? So. Those are two great questions. The first one is really a challenging question because on the one hand, you know, the goal here really from a company's perspective is just to show non-inferiority and then at least in their minds, you know, they can claim victory. And, and I think there's some truth to that. And I think it's important to do what the FDA said because it takes us from a, a place uh, of uncertainty where we don't really know, do sulfonylureas reduce the risk of MI or do they increase it? There's data going both ways. There's that older data with ischemic preconditioning and potassium-dependent uh, ATPases. Maybe uh, sulfonylureas are, are, are bad. Uh, it's never been resolved. Uh, same with TZDs, some data showing benefits, some showing harm, the whole rosy glitazone controversy you're all familiar with. Uh, so I think nailing down what the cardiovascular effect of these drugs are is important. I think, though, one thing we've learned from SABRE is we should expand what cardiovascular means. It doesn't just mean ischemic. It should, in my opinion, also include heart failure. So it should include cardiac outcomes. And going beyond that, uh, of course, I think we want to look at other things, cancer, fractures, pancreatitis. So I think what the FDA told the companies to do uh, and what a lot of academicians then collaborated with industry and, and, and did these outcome trials, I think it's a good thing. But, you know, if the goal is to prove superiority, that almost needs to be a different design than if the goal is just to show non-inferiority, right? Because the goal showing non-inferiority of a drug that's already on the market, well, you sort of want to do that quickly. You really don't want to wait 20 years because by that time, you know, it's, it's too late for patients who might be on the drug exposed to not only lack of benefit but potentially harm. So it, it, it's difficult. We gave a lot of thought of how to design the trial, and it wasn't easy to come up with something that satisfied the FDA requirement, did it in a time and cost efficient way, but then also had a reasonable likelihood of answering these bigger questions, which as academicians, that's what we would have really loved to do. But um, you know, it'd have to be a different trial. You'd almost really need a trial of drug lowering hemoglobin A1C by a significant amount versus mandated placebo, no add-on therapy. But again, you know, for ethical reasons, it can be challenging, uh, and just logistical reasons, even if you didn't believe in hemoglobin A1C lowering. Uh, it, it just would be hard to do those trials. So uh, I, I can't really think of a great design that serves all masters and answers all questions at once. But, um, you know, potentially uh, an alternative approach would be to use the registries that we've got now and embed clinical trials. You know, Sunil Rao's just done this successfully. Uh, along with uh, a lot of you here at DCRI with uh, a specific question having to do with uh, vascular access in women. But perhaps that same approach could be used for generic diabetes drugs, sulfonylureas, and, you know, randomizations in that context. I don't mean observational data from registries. That can be valuable too, but I don't think it will tease out the answer to, to, to the question of whether hemoglobin A1C uh, reduces uh, 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 cardiovascular outcomes, but I think embedding randomized clinical trials might be a, a really cost-effective way to answer these questions, especially questions that industry isn't optimally designed to answer, right? The, the durations of these trials may extend the life cycle management of the drug, the patent life of the drug. So I think there are a bit of different uh, uh, questions, and they may need different approaches and funding mechanisms. Your second question, the heart failure one, that's been a very common question after the SAVER trial. And, uh, you know, again, I think this is a real finding. I realize that if you think of all the endpoints we examine in SABRE, not just the primary and secondary endpoint and its components, I mean, there, there's about seven components. So even a strict Bonferroni, the, the hospitalization for heart failure holds up. But if you think about the pancreatitis, the cancer, you know, then we looked at 100 endpoints, then it, it, it wouldn't hold up um, as significant. But, but it does smell real because the other predictors of hospitalization for heart failure made sense. That is, history of uh, prior heart failure was the most powerful predictor in the placebo or saxagliptin arm of, of, of hospitalization for heart failure. So I don't think it was some miscoding of COPD flare or pneumonia as heart failure. You know, these endpoints were adjudicated. It could be, again, that BNP effect that I mentioned because DPP4 inhibition could raise certain BNPs depending on the assay, but it didn't appear that um, it was just heart failure solely adjudicated on BNP levels that was driving that differential. We're still teasing out some of that and hope to have that by AHA. So I think it's a real finding. You know, in the uh, examined database, they didn't report anything in the New England Journal of Medicine paper or 
uh, in the initial presentation at ESC by Dr. White. When he presented the data at EASD, he did show some heart failure data. You know, it wasn't statistically significant, but the hazard ratio was around 1.2. Our hazard ratio was around 1.27. So uh, the discussant uh, for, e, uh, for EASD, the diabetes meeting in Europe, for SAVER and EXAMINE pulled those findings and, of course, driven by SAVER, it was still very statistically significant. So one could interpret that as a class effect. That's how I would. Um, you know, some people might interpret that as individual differences between drugs within a class. That's probably what, you know, the makers of aliquiptin are saying, but I, I think that's less likely. And others would just say we have to wait for further trials to see what the truth really is, and we'll never be able to figure it out just by parsing the SAVER data uh, even further. So uh, I think a lot more to be seen. But the, the, the key two messages, I think, with respect to heart failure are, a, we should be measuring it in these trials where we're evaluating cardiovascular safety of drugs. It's kind of silly if you think about it that it's not part of the primary endpoint. And B, uh, that there is a lot of heart failure and diabetes, and when the two coexist, the subsequent rate of hospitalization for heart failure is tremendous. In our study, if you came in and you'd um, uh, had baseline uh, history of heart failure in, in, during the course of the trial, a quarter of those patients, you know, were we hospitalized for heart failure. So, and, and in uh, terms of incremental risk, that risk was higher with saxagliptin versus placebo, but dwarfed by just baseline predictors of heart failure, such as renal dysfunction and prior history of heart failure. So probably an area that we should really examine further, that overlap. And, uh, you know, for that sort of question, uh, registries, I see the uh, AHA folks here, um, you know, registries are, are very well designed just to see observationally what kind of event rates are these people having. And I think it's something maybe heart failure experts like yourself have appreciated, but I sure don't think general cardiologists, endocrinologists, or primary care physicians have appreciated that. Thanks. Before we take the next question, question could you just hit next so people can get their code to... Uh, well, next will be a while because... Next will be a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. You know, when you come to DCRI, yeah, okay, they tell sorry. me, come prepared. So I, I, I had lots of backup slides. Why don't um, V-Bucks doing that? Uh, Dr. Mark. Yeah. Oh, there's the code for those of you who want to see it. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Superb uh, presentation of, uh, of this trial. And, but I have to say that I was, as I was listening to you and looking at the results, um, I kept wondering, uh, from a from a learning perspective, it seems very clear that this was a worthwhile endeavor. But from a post-trial uh, clinician's perspective, I don't see any reason to use this drug. It seems like you proved that the drug is as good as placebo, and it's clearly going to be more expensive than placebo, whatever the placebo, you know. But, but we can well, basically- We're a lot for placebo these days. <laughs> we can build it with, with, a, with a less, expensive uh, program of therapy. We can get the same results. And I just wonder why, you know, why that is considered a good thing by the FDA or why, and why sure. anybody should want to use it. So that's a great question, and you put it very politely, but there were certainly cardiologists at ESC that said, you know, you've just shown that there's a, a drug that is not inferior to placebo, it's expensive, why would you ever use it? I think that's a legitimate point for discussion, but it's interesting, some cardiologists said that. The reception in the endocrinology community was quite different. That is, they really viewed these drugs, I'd say the majority of endocrinologists, not all, some also took the viewpoint, why not just stick with cheap generic drugs, but the majority of endocrinologists really thought these data were terrific. And I, by these data, I don't mean just SABER, but EXAMINE as well, which, <coughs> though smaller, essentially had the same message, uh, other than the heart failure finding. And I think the reason that they're excited is in real life, if you're treating diabetic patients, especially if you're a subspecialist like an endocrinologist or a primary care physician, probably less so cardiologists or cardiac surgeons because we're not as often treating uh, diabetes. If someone's got a hemoglobin A1C of 9, presumably you've already told them to lose weight, eat right, and they're already on metformin, you know, wh what are you going to do next? So you could say sulfonylureas, they're cheap and familiar. But as I said, there is uncertainty about what they do with respect to cardiovascular risk. Uh, you could go with TZDs. Well, rosiglitazone, not so easy to prescribe anymore. Could go with pioglitazone, but if your patients at all surf the net like many of mine do, 
they've read that pioglitazone causes bladder cancer. So once they've read cancer, they don't want to take that drug. So then you're left with injectable drugs. Well, you can do that, but there's some patients that say, you know, I'm not going to take that insulin injection or even that GLP-1 agonist injection. So I wouldn't ever think that DPP-4 inhibitors, certainly I didn't think this before, and I don't think it now, should be used as first-line therapy. I think maybe second-line therapy, but certainly when you're talking about third-line therapy, I think it's a reasonably safe option. Uh, so that's the real role that I see for these drugs. It's like treating hypertension. If you're treating diabetes in the thick of it, there are a lot of patients that need polypharmacy. Now, you could uh, extend your argument and say, you know, what evidence is there that drugs beyond metformin or, you know, really reducing microvascular outcomes for that matter. And that's a much bigger, broader question. There is an assumption going on here, that is, that DPP-4 inhibitors or a lot of the diabetes drugs that we use uh, lower hemoglobin A1C. Lowering hemoglobin A1C reduces microvascular outcomes. Therefore, drugs that lower hemoglobin A1C lower microvascular outcomes. So there are some assumptions there. But, you know, barring megatrials in the 50 to 100,000 patient range that go on for a decade, I don't know that we'll really be able to nail down the answers to those questions. So if we're challenging that fundamental assumption, you know, that um, might be the right thing to do. Uh, but would require much bigger, more expensive, complex trials. So I think these two trials, SAVER and EXAMINE, show that DPP-4 inhibitors are a reasonable second or third line agent as add-on therapy, reasonably safe, no unanticipated findings other than the heart failure one, uh, and I think are, are reasonable to use. But I wouldn't jump to them as first line therapy. I think there might have been a little bit of a movement among some primary care physicians to do that because of the safety profile, but I'd say, you know, stick with what the guidelines say to do, which is largely to start with metformin. In the back, thanks. I would like to ask a question regarding patient population. Um, uh, sometimes diabetic and with obese patient, uh, some medication doesn't work very well. So how was the you know, uh, patient population uh, regarding obesity and diabetes? Yeah, the BMI was a bit over, uh, it was 31 if I remember right. The effect of the drug on weight was neutral. It didn't cause weight gain. It didn't cause weight loss. So that is a plus compared to a lot of diabetes drugs to get back to Dr. Mark's question. On the other hand, it's not like a GLP-1 agonist where you see weight loss. Great. Well, I want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very much.